What is up my fellow members of the new JSA? Welcome to my Stargirl Season 2 Episode 1 Recap review and breakdown. So finally, you guys have been able to see episode one and, and I just, do you not agree with me with what I said in my non-spoiler review? I feel like that was a great episode to set everything up. I mean, what's the premiere episode meant to do? It sets the tone right at the beginning. There's, you know, a little bit of stuff going on, setting up the characters throughout. There's a bunch of other things, but then there's Cindy at the end with that little tease. I, I remember when I first saw that, especially with that last photo being put down, I was just like, Oh, this, 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 this diabolical plan is for sure gonna throw a spanner in the work, so to speak. But then there's just other little cool things, such as little Easter eggs in this, which I was delighted to see, such as Clifford DeVoe in one of the JSA files that Pat kept in the basement. It's just a bunch of Stargirl goodness. So I don't want to ramble too much more at the beginning of this. Let's get into the breakdown. Let's get into my thoughts on the episode. I read every last one of your comments, so I really want to know what you thought about this. Let me know everything down in the comments below, but let's get get into this. So it starts in Melody Hills, Indiana, decades ago. Now this, this intro, and yet again, if you remember my spoiler free review, if you're one of the people who watched that, you will know that I said it, it set quite the creepy tone, and I had heard that Jeff Johns had said a similar thing. There was quite an effort put in there to make this really, really creepy, and definitely, definitely introduce the slow burn, shall I say, to Eclipso, because, you know, what I want to say is they don't want to shove Eclipso in your face straight away, but what they can do is slowly get that cooking in the background. So initially we see that young girl called Rebecca who wants to go to the party but she's stuck at home with mum. And she leaves the house and she looks out into the garden and the wind chimes start ringing. The garden furniture toys are kind of hauntingly moving around a bit. So it's like some kind of mysterious power has just entered the vicinity. So then there's this kid who appears, introduces himself as Bruce. I do just want to reassure you, just because I've seen more episodes than this, I'm not going to give anything away, and the bullet points that I, would, that I have taken are from my pure thoughts as of when I saw the episode. So anything I come out with is quite literally what I was speculating at the time. So I really don't want anyone to think now I'm going to be like giving away something that happen happens in five episodes time. So this is something that I really just connected when I first saw it. If you remember my breakdowns way back, like months ago, when we first heard about Eclipso coming to start Girl season 2, I did a breakdown on the character, and guess who the first kind of host of Eclipso was? A man named Bruce Gordon. Now what do we see here? A kid named Bruce, and, and I think we can figure out who this person is. It's obviously Eclipso, especially with what goes down there, my god. But yeah, if you if you haven't figured it out already, they're being really true to the comics here. It's a bit creepy. I mean, it does say decades ago at the same time, so not everything is apparent here, but blatantly this kid is Bruce Gordon. Eclipso is kind of using this kid form to go to Rebecca, and he's basically tempting this young poor girl, Rebecca, to give in to a little bit of her desires. It's kind of like the devil in a way, trying to give in to a little bit of a sinful mode. If you know a little bit about Eclipso, I do recommend checking out my previous videos, but long story short, he basically preys and feasts off the, the darkness or if any kind of shed of darkness of a said person, or you could say their soul even, and that's kind of what he was sucking in. Or should I just say absorbing the, the, the life force, and he, the more kind of diabolical or kind of darker deeds he gets or can put upon a person, he, that, that is more of a tasty fear and, and, and sinful kind of meal for him to absorb. I like how the kid version of Eclipso here tried to kind of make it even more frightening for this little girl. So when she opened the doll, it was like bloody red. Like this is quite dark. Like seriously, the imagery and symbolic aspects to all this was very dark. This is exactly what Eclipso does. I really thought they did a fantastic effort with the kind of atmosphere, like the score and the music in the background was haunting. And ultimately it just ended with young, Bruce Gordon there, aka Eclipso, going full on undead mode. He brings out the diamond and yeah, he basically absorbs her, her, just her life force, I guess, her soul. With all of that said and done, ladies and gentlemen, did you notice, did you notice the very big little hint that they gave you right before they cut away at the introduction of, of Stargo episode one? That is on the little post box there, it says McNider. Now, if you know a little thing or two, does McNider ring a bell? Well, Charles McNider is the original Dr. Midnight. So, I just, I, I don't want to say anything, but I'm just saying, 
They put that there for a reason. So after that fantastic intro, we get the title sequence of Stargirl Summer School. Now this is where all the very familiar footage of the episode comes in. If you've been on the ball with all the trailers and teaser footage, it's about Courtney having to go back into summer school because of neglecting her grades due to being a hardcore superhero. She's just really going out there trying to be super vigilant. And that's exactly what they set up. I love the song choice at the beginning here. It's a very upbeat kind of feeling going into the second season. We have Stargirl just flying around, but then obviously we get that scene with her back flipping, being very ready to tackle whoever and whatever, but it turns out to just be a raccoon. This brings us, I just feel like I've spoken about this a billion times already just from the trailers because this is the moment I feel like we're mo all familiar with most. We have Rick, Yolanda and everyone coming out just like sixth or seventh night this week. No criminals, no ISA, nothing. But one thing I was happy to see with Beth Chappell, aka the new Doctor Midnight in this moment, is that she did have her goggles on, because that's one thing from the trailers I was wondering about. I was just like, okay, so wait, wait but the, the goggles smashed last season. But it, as it turns out, that's not really properly Chuck. It's just like a very basic AI. I'm sure that the fact they've got the JSA HQ, she kind of put something together, but this obviously isn't the Chuck that we know and love from last season. But what I do like about it and what I do appreciate with what the the episode gets into with the scenes after this with Courtney back at home she's in the basement looking through Pat's JSA archived files on the ISA it's 4 a.m but like you have to understand where Courtney's coming th from a big part of last season is that her drive to be Stargirl is there was a bit of ambiguity surrounding that she thought she could be Starman's daughter like a true legacy she realized that she wasn't but I feel like from the where the character's standing she wants to not necessarily prove herself more than ever, but just be everything that is Stargo. And, and she feels like she needs to work around the clock to, to personify that and live up to that heroic mantle. But she doesn't need to go this Ham. But this scene held some even more goodies. Now this is what I was teasing about in my non-spoiler review, but you will see even more of this throughout the episodes. There are just Easter eggs, Easter eggs, Easter eggs galore. And so Courtney tries to explain what that good reason is through the research of what about Per Degaton? And that's when we get some cool little answers. And, and I, I love stuff like this because it's just left to the imagination of the viewers. Well, the Flash banished him to an alternate timeline. But it's just like so cool to imagine that having once happened to Per Degaton. But then Courtney's just like, what happened to Blackbriar Thorn? And he's just like, well, yeah, the, the Green Lantern uh, kind of destroyed him in 88. But then, Baron Blitzkrieg and Corpaz just like, for crying out loud, trust me, there's nothing to be worried about. So it is kind of like the boy or girl who cried wolf, however, as what we can tell in this episode, Courtney is low-key kind of right, especially with Cindy, Eclipso, and then that is when the Green Lantern battery glows as well, which is a massive, massive little foreshadowing for later on. Now up next, we get some scenes of Pat planning this vacation for the family. And this is when we get our first proper scenes of Mike and how he's saying he was hoping he would start off this summer with maybe showing him some of the ropes, the family business, and I really can't blame Mike at all because he's really just wanting to be included. That's a big thing uh, for him this season. Season. But Pat, obviously, and, and this is what anyone would do, I'm sure, if, if they were in a similar position, is trying to kind of shut that down, saying, no, you know, we're going to be going on holiday. Your paper round, and this is a really cool little Easter egg for later on, your buddy Jakeem is going to take over the paper route until we get back. We call it paper round over here, not route, but either way. Uh, Jakeem! Jakeem was name dropped right here and then. Jakeem being Jakeem Thunder from the comics, the one who does go on to equip and, and hold the mantle and title of Jakeem Thunder, uh, equipping the, the pink pen with the Thunderbolt. Now guys, the next scene we have to talk about is Beth Chappell working on restarting Dr. McKnight's AI. Now the reboot failed initially. This makes for a sad Beth Chappell. I, I hate seeing Beth sad, especially with the story that's going on this season because initially in this moment she made breakfast for her parents, good old Beth, as last season we see that. She has this kind of uh, characteristic of wanting to always try hard to like be there for her parents and have family time, but they're always working. So she's really the one left in the lurch. And that is exactly with what happens next because they're kind of talking. Her parents don't really seem to have a great idea what's going on with her at school. But this is when she finds that piece of paper, which is indeed a petition for divorce, which is not nice for anyone. And then you have that beautiful score in the background. I just, I don't know. I, I, I feel like this scene with Beth, it just instantly melts my heart because she she is quite a bit of a newbie character especially when she's in the Doctor Midnight costume just like oh what do I do but like there's something so charming about her at the same time and and I don't know I, I just felt 
really bad for her in this moment. But also that aside, with like the I thought like this is an interesting, compelling story for her character, just with the family drama. The whole thing with the goggles has got me really, really intrigued as well. But talking about character stories, this is this is what I meant yet again in my non-spoiler review, in how I said there's obviously an overarching storyline being set up, cooked up, the intro of Eclipse, all of this good stuff. But I really like how if you're going down the path of all the new GSA characters, it does the path does start to diverge for each character with a compelling story. So up next with Rick, he starts driving in his father's fixed up car. He carries on walking throughout the woods, which is when he finds some bottles on the floor and lo and behold, a big ass footprint. So this is obviously Solomon Grundy. And what I found really interesting in this moment when I first saw it is just like, oh wow. Like, so like Rick is kind of, it's it's almost like what the opposite of what you would expect. Rick is the one seeking Solomon Grundy out almost, or at least he's kind of investigating here that this is where he's hanging out. And where is this going to go? Up next with Yolanda, this is what I meant with my Eclipso comment, because we see, and I really felt like Yvette Monreal's performance here was really on point. I've spoke many times before of how the character tease for what's going on with her this season is still dealing with the aftermath of taking Brainwave's life. You know, at the end of the day, she you still always got to wonder, is there another way I could have done that? So she enters the confession booth and she gets very emotional even before talking. But then ultimately she decides that she's just going to sit there and not really talk about, well, that kind of confession that she really wants to talk about, which is indeed Brainwave's murder. But the biggest thing is that this is where she kind of gets like a mind hijack. She, she almost gets like migraine, like actual pain. Now my bullet points here, as I said, taken at the time as when I was watching the episode, I, I have to think that this is Eclipso related. It doesn't make it abundantly obvious because, for example, you would have to assume that the priest would have to be kind of hijacked by Eclipso to, I guess, maybe bring that out in Yolanda. One thing I even speculated about way before we even got the season two trailer, like last year after the, the events of the first season is that Eclipso's story can and actually has pertained to Yolanda's larger family before, but I thought maybe that would be flipped onto Yolanda herself, especially after, guess what? I mean, if Eclipso just fed off the, the darkness of a girl who stole a freaking doll, imagine the absolute tasty treat Yolanda's soul or, or, or guilty conscience will have. So do, do you know what I'm trying to say there? And I do really enjoy the, the conversation with Courtney after this with how she says how she still hears brainwave and the sound that he made when he died in her head. It's all she can think about. And she doesn't know if she even deserves to be Wildcat because he she believes that Ted Grant would never do that or what she did. It is a big kind of decent question of how, yeah, would the JSA have done that? Like killed another member now in my opinion and it feels in my rules of being a superhero as well like i would or i would only really be happy with someone like a superhero whether it's any jsa member justice league member whatever you only kill when you absolutely have to and i think it's absolutely fine i i'm not saying that the hero isn't affected but i'm just saying in a logical, rational perspective. With what she said about Ted Grant here, you could argue he would never do what she did, but in the situation that she was in, I think she was perfectly justified. Brainwave was insanely powerful. He could kill you with his mind. So when she was in that situation, he would have gone on to kill them all, like undoubtedly. So I feel like the actions that she did is all she could have done in that moment. But in this moment, they realized like, oh my God, Cameron's back. Cameron, Mark Kent, the son of Jordan Mark Kent, AKA Icicle. Now they're obviously like, oh my god, what do I say to him? You, you say nothing, Court, because they're kind of freaking out with, if he ever learned out that the girl he fancies, Stargirl, killed his, well, didn't really kill his father, but like, you know, was kind of involved in all of that ice cube shattering business, then yeah, it, it might backfire. You can imagine he might just, he might, you, a guy who doesn't seem like, because Cameron, the son of Jordan, doesn't seem like the guy who would turn out to be a villain. He seems like a really nice guy, but you could, easily see a cliche kind of if he finds out something like that he would go to the dark side of the force or something in this moment as well we have the fiddler's son isaac bowen knock into courtney he does not seem happy and speaking of we have that moment at the lunch table between courtney and artemis croc of course sportsmaster and tigress's daughter now artemis from her perspective believes and she was even talking about in this moment that her parents were put away again for a total frame job for some robberies that was done way before she was born so she thinks they're just paying for something they did a long time ago she has no idea that they are 
a part of the Injustice Society of America. But in Courtney's super hyper vigilant state, she she instantly thought when Artemis was going to give the hockey stick to her friend that she just decked her. Uh, that that's not a good way to start off with. Well, it's technically not starting off with Artemis Croc because she interacted with her last season. But yeah, that's definitely not the way to be getting on with Artemis Croc right now, especially in the face of her dealing with what she has with her parents. This all leads us to the moment where Courtney gets pulled into the principal's office and all of the stuff from the trailers of what we kind of knew was happening. It's like, you need to go to summer school, your grades have been slipping, but regardless, I want to talk about the next big scene. And this is really kind of ambiguous still for me, even with all the episodes I've seen, because it's quite a slow burner. But we get a tease of the continuation of Sylvester Pemberton. Now, if I remember correctly, this scene was in and around Nevada. And this is when he says, I'm looking for your ex-husband. She says, which one? The one who likes stripes. So, it looks like Pat's ex-wife Maggie is in the picture this season to some capacity. So all we can draw out of this is that Sylvester Pemberton is still looking for Pat. He's now gone to his ex-wife to, you know, find out where he's held up in Blue Valley, which I'm sure will lead him into town at some point. But I guess this scene is just meant to serve the purpose of, don't worry, like the Sylvester Pemberton Starman stuff is very mysterious and it's still coming your way. And I'm still very intrigued about this. How is he still around? Is this even him? I don't get it. I'm very super fascinated with this plot thread though. After this in the episode, we get a scene between Courtney and Cameron. She actually goes over to him. They start talking and Cameron seems very happy to see her. But then the, the, the main thing out of this is I totally forgot about Icicle's parents. Like they're still a thing. And this is when they start talking about how he should know the truth about that wicked girl. And then the granddad's like, he's smiling. Let him be happy. And it's quite an interesting situation. Like they must be furious. Like they know that she's Stargirl and she's in the JSA who helped contribute to their son's death. That must be pretty hard, like, knowing that your grandson's talking to the person who had some involvement in that. But it's quite cool how the granddad's still like, look, look, he's smiling, he's happy. Uh, either way, though, this is interesting stuff. It's, it's treading almost on... On, on very soft ground. You need to be careful, like, with this whole situation. Like, Courtney likes him, he likes her, but she knows more about the situation than he does. Then you've got the freaking parents of Icicle. It's just a bit of a dodgy situation. I feel like this is what I mean. There's so many interesting little facets that Stargirl Season 2 has, and who knows where they're gonna go with even things like this. But going back to Pat and the garage, so this was very predictable, though, with uh, Seek kind of taking care of things now that the holiday's been cancelled. He returns to the shop to say, I don't really need you anymore, man. But Zeke, of course, went into the employees only room. Now, we gathered this much from the trailer. We saw that Zeke, I didn't know who he was at the time, obviously, but somebody was working on an upgrade for Stripe Z, and that is with a lovely upgrade of a flamethrower. It's nice to know that the Stripe robot itself is, is going to get subtle upgrades, and, you know, it's going to be even better when we see some of this stuff in action. But, ladies and gentlemen, continuing on that Grundy little subplot that we've got going on with Rick Tyler, what I find super, super fascinating about this story line to just kind of build upon my hype from earlier is that Rick then brings bags of takeaway buckets of chicken to the location of where he saw Grundy's footprint. The main takeaway from this from me is I, I don't really kind of like the compassion that Rick has here, especially after going to and throw with Grundy in that fight at the end of last season is that despite killing his parents, Rick knows that Grundy was just an innocent tool used by the ISA. I mean, I, it's kind of like bless him. This is such a sweet story. Like Grundy... He's not meant to be that kind of like dumb King Shark type, you know, like vibe gimmick character that the Suicide Squad movie has. I'm not saying that I don't like that, by the way, I do like it. But Grundy, he seems to have so much, only so much capacity that even when we saw him last season after uh, Rick was punching his face in, he was very kind of like, please don't hurt me. Do you know what I mean? So I think Rick's coming to terms with the fact that even though he comes across as a monster. He isn't a monster. If anything, he was equipped as a monster, but that doesn't inherently mean who he is. And I find this, just the score, the music, the, the story here, very fascinating. And the fact that he's now providing for him, it's like, where is this going to go? But all I know is that I'm, I'm definitely here for it. And I can't wait to see what you guys have to say about this as well in the comments. But speaking of those kind of isolated stories, this is what I mean. Continuing along the Beth Chapel vibes, putting that kind of more feelsy storyline aside, this is when the goggles turn back on. So obviously Beth is absolutely ecstatic with this. There's some kind of glitchy stuff going on with the operating system of the goggles ever since they got destroyed by Icicle. She's saying how much she misses him, but the intrigue intriguing aspect is he's saying Beth 
Beth, I don't know you. And then the goggles turn off. So there's something larger going on here, obviously. But whilst as much as that is fascinating, my heart still melted, especially after the scene with the, the parents, if you will, because this is when Beth's just like, Chuck, please don't go. Please, please, please don't forget me, man. This just brought out the feels. I, I just feel really bad for Beth. Uh, and she obviously had quite an anchor when she found the new role of Dr. Midnight in Chuck. You know, it was a way for her to kind of get that attention and uh, kind of closeness in a way for someone who would always be there. And that was the goggles AI of Chuck. But now her parents are getting divorced. She doesn't have Chuck. She just kind of has this kind of secondhand AI version of him at the beginning of the episode. I just feel really bad for her. And I feel like they're writing this story for her character specifically really, really well. But anyway, everyone, we cut to Courtney. And this is all leading up to that Green Lantern moment. But what I absolutely love about what Stargirl does, just like how we got the photo of Green Arrow is speedy and the Shining Knight last season and all these other little cool Easter eggs. When Courtney is looking at the old JSA files, we have, lo and behold, another kind of little mugshot of another villain. And that is, of course, Clifford DeVoe, aka The Thinker. Now, I'm not trying to draw too much out of this. I just really appreciate it as a fan who likes to see these extra details. That might not mean anything to some people sat on the sofa as they're watching this episode, but I don't know. Just love the fact that the JSA in my head can of fought The Thinker. It is Clifford DeVoe. He's even wearing his thinking cap in the mugshot. It's just brilliant. Uh, it's just another detail I really appreciated, and somewhere The Thinker is out there, and this is his iteration in this universe. But this is is when it finally happens, ladies and gentlemen, when Courtney hears a break-in, and this is the moment she's been waiting for, like a shady, sketchy moment. She is ready, she gets the staff, and she goes downstairs. And this is when the battle with Alan Scott's daughter ensues. And it was a really cool little fight. Now, if you thought that this choreography and fight scene was good, just you wait. Oh my god, just you wait. Now, one thing is, I like arrow combat, and I think a lot of people would put up there in the Arrowverse that obviously with Arrow being a vigilante show predominantly, that its action was, if not is, probably some of the best we've got out of the past decade of superhero TV. But like, I, I wholly disagree. Like, the, what they achieve in Stargirl with, you know, they, they go for the extra effort of instead of just cutting and just changing and filming the fight from a different angle, what they do is they go for the effort of like kind of panning the camera to make it look more like one sequence. Obviously it isn't, the camera does cut, but they go those extra levels to kind of like turn the camera upside down when the character gets flipped upside down. It's just brilliant. I think it's so engaging. It's, it's that extra level of quality and effort with this approach to the battle between two characters and I just thought it was amazing. Do you think this is cool guys? Just you wait. Seriously, just you freaking wait for the other fight scenes we're gonna get. But after that final Green Lantern proper blast when the ring just like she clenches her fist and it incinerates out, she says I am Green Lantern's daughter. The family come down and they're just like what, what the hell, Courtney? But that's technically not where it ended, because that's what we can say about that right now until the next episode. But it then continued with Cindy. So Cindy Berman goes into Blue Valley High to access the ISA HQ. Very kind of bad bitch vibes, if you know what I mean, just to say it very frankly. That's what I really love about Cindy's character and Shiv as a whole. She's just got a... I mean, there's a lot of vulnerability to the character that we've gotten to before, but the front that she puts on is like a proper, yeah, you don't want to mess with me. I've got a plan. Like, I'm going to I'm gonna tear shit up, basically. And the interesting thing is that I mentioned that file in my trailer breakdown, and I wanted to know what the file was, and lo and behold, it says on it, Injustice Unlimited. So that is a very much so a big plan of Cindy's, and I like how she's given it an operation name as well of hers that she is uh, planning to go through with, and we get get little teases of it in this moment and I thought it was a brilliant way to end the episode because my mouth kind of dropped to the floor because it wasn't like a, the biggest shock in the world but it's like holy crap it's more the fascination of what are you planning to do Cindy like what are you planning to do and the fact that they've even gone there makes my mind think all kind of things especially as of the time of only seeing episode one I was like okay she puts down the cards for Henry's photo there she rips that because he's out of the picture but then she sees Artemis Croc still on the table then she sees the Fiddler's son Isaac Bowen from earlier okay he's still on the table then of course Cameron Markin still on the table. All of these are candidates for the new ISA Unlimited, if you will, unlike Henry, who is no longer with us. But then, ladies and gentlemen, there is another photo to be put on the table. And she's looking at it, and it's like, oh, who is this going to be? And then you see Mike 
Dugan. It's like, what? Cindy, what do you plan to do with Mike? And it also just makes you think, so if they're doing this, are the writers actually planning? Like, because then you just start thinking, okay, so if she's done this, this must mean something might happen in the future, right? So it's just like, wait, is Mike really going to go dark side? Like, isn't that too predictable or something like that? I don't know. Like, I was just thinking all kinds of things right now, but I need to know your thoughts about this end of the episode. Like, was your mind just thinking... Like, the last person you'd expect Cindy Berman to put on the table for people to kind of, like, start up a new ISA Unlimited team with was Mike Dugan. But the file name in of itself is a really cool just comic book reference anyway. I mean, of course, this is Stargirl. They, they're always going to kind of be accurate when they can. So I, I, like Injustice Unlimited is an actual successor group to, and it's obvious anyway, like she's recruiting a new team, but it's deliberately from the comic books, Injustice Unlimited was a group reestablished by the wizard intended to be a successor to the ISA. Now with the old ISA gone in this live action iteration, well, this is this live action iteration led by Cindy this time rather than the wizard bringing about that successor group um, to the original ISA Injustice Society of America with her Injustice Society of America and these are the people uh, who that she well it seems to be flexing and putting on the table that she's going to go after so that little that little evil laugh at the end as well because that wasn't it she then holds the heart of darkness the black diamond if you will you hear Eclipse in there saying I am ready to serve you and then she's like yes let's go do some recruiting and you hear the both kind of maniacal laughter uh, just just harmonize together almost as if like oh boy this is what I mean about Stargirl Courtney Whitmore not crying wolf you know she she was right literally there's there's a big diabolical plan in the works and I just thought that was the end to a great premiere episode like I know it's been going on for a while now I know I've been rambling and saying some of the similar things with that but I felt like it was a great premiere episode and the best is still yet to come from what I've seen like this was really strong but it only keeps building upon it layer by layer driven content all the time there's no waste of time stuff even when what you would regard as if there was any regard of waste of time stuff in Stargirl, that's still not a waste of time. Do you know what I mean? So I think the introduction of Eclipso and then ending it with a tease of Eclipso was perfect. The content in the middle of the episode that fleshed out multiple character stories with Rick going along with Grundy and what's going on there. Yolanda seeming to get some weird kind of mind hijacking going on there. I I'm just a massive fan of this and I can't wait to see your responses down in the comments below. It was also trinkled with cool former ISA villain Easter eggs. So ultimately guys, I think it's a fantastic start. What did you think of Stargirl season two, episode one? Seemingly no shade in this episode, but trust me, that doesn't, don't let that disappoint you. Trust me. You will see him when you see him, and everything comes when it's supposed to. That's all I want to reassure you there. If there's any uh, la underwhelming feelings from this, I would be surprised to hear that from people. But if there is, just on the count of, like, maybe the shade, don't be. Trust me, just you wait. So other than that, click the links in the top pinned comment, which is my comment. Follow me on Twitter. Join my Discord server to talk about Stargirl with me personally. But thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day, and I'll see you members of the JSA in the next video. Goodbye.